This morning we are continuing in our verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of John. We hit John chapter 4, verses 43 to 54 in this study. And really what we're given into today, in today's study is an account. It's a story. And it's an account of one man's journey to true belief. One man's journey to true belief. This is what the story is. This is what the account is all about. We're going to see a man who has a need. And this man brings his need to Jesus. He then believes the word of Jesus. And then he gets to see true restoration from Jesus. Now, in case you're wondering, this account of Jesus healing the son of this official, well, that's not just in here just by chance. But instead, it's important that we understand and recognize that John, who is the author of this, this, this gospel account here, he specifically handpicked this, this account, and he did so with a specific purpose in mind. You see, throughout the Gospel of John, and we have mentioned this in previous weeks as well, but throughout the Gospel of John, John has chosen to choose seven specific sign miracles, and he has done this simply because we're told in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Seven sign miracles that Jesus performed, and we ask, why did John include these in here? Well, it tells us in John 20, 31, he says, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So he's saying, look, there's a lot of stuff that Jesus did, but John says, I didn't include everything within this gospel account, but he goes on to say, but these are written, in other words, those things, those accounts and those stories are written, he says there, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. And so this is the reason why John chose and specifically handpicked these seven sign miracles that he disperses throughout the Gospel of John. He does so so that we would see Christ, that we would understand Christ, and that we would believe that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world, and that by believing in him, we would have eternal, everlasting life in his name. Now, we saw the first sign miracle that Jesus did back in John chapter 2. This is Jesus turning water into wine. We are seeing today in today's passage the second sign miracle that he does, and this is where he heals the nobleman's son. And if you look in your passage in chapter 4 right there, look down to the very last verse there. It says in verse 54, he says, this again is the second sign which Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So this is sign number 2. Now, when we get over to chapter 5, we're going to see the third sign miracle that Jesus does. This is where he heals the lame man. Then we get to chapter 6, John chapter 6. We see the fourth sign miracle, Jesus feeding the multitude. Also, in chapter 6, we're going to see the fifth sign miracle, Jesus walking on the water. When we get to chapter 9, we're going to see the sixth sign miracle, when Jesus heals the blind man. And then finally, when we get to John chapter 11, we're going to see the seventh sign miracle, and this is where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But again, why? Why, John? Why have you put these accounts in here? Why have you put these stories in here? Well, he's specifically chosen these specific accounts so that we may, you might, believe in Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you would have eternal life in his name. This is the reason for why John has written this book that we're studying through here today, so that, so that, this is what makes the Gospel of John such a tremendous book of the Bible to give to someone to read if they are interested in Jesus or they want to inquire further about Jesus. And if you're here this morning and if, if you're kind of sitting on the fence at the moment as to who Jesus is and what he, who he is, where he's come from, what he's all about, I'd encourage you, read through the Gospel of John. It's written specifically for you so that you can actually understand the truth of who Jesus actually is. Now, as we give our attention to today's passage, this is sign miracle number what? One? It's sign miracle number two. As we give our attention to sign miracle number two, well, what we're going to see here is that Jesus heals the son of a noble official, and what we get to see in here is a man's journey 
to true belief. Now, for many of us as believers, I think we would agree that our coming to faith, our coming to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it was most certainly a journey. I think we would agree on this. As we think back to our experience, there were no doubt a variety of steps that we went along as God was orchestrating these things behind the scenes, and God orchestrating all these things behind the scenes eventually came to us, placing our trust in and coming to a genuine saving faith in Jesus. Now, at the time, we have had no idea, no doubt. We didn't actually understand that we were on a journey. We were just tracking along, and circumstances were happening, things were taking place, and for us, it was all happening in real time, and we thought to ourselves, I guess this is just life. However, when we look back, what do we see? We see God's handiwork. We see God working each step along the way in this journey, leading us to a place of true belief, true trust, true confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I ask the question, why? Why is it important that we understand this? Why is it important that we go back and we remember the journey that we ourselves went on in coming to faith? And in particular, why is it important for us to remember when it comes to our evangelistic efforts among unbelievers? Well, you see, sometimes, sometimes we can mistakenly think of a person's faith or a person coming to faith, we can sometimes think of it in a very narrow kind of way. We can think of a person's journey beginning and ending with the specific conversation that we might be having with them, failing to see that our involvement in another person's life and helping to bring them to faith, that may be just one part of the process of which God may be choosing to use while God is orchestrating a whole, a whole host of things behind the scenes. And sometimes, sometimes when we lose sight of the, the fact that people are on a process in coming to faith that God is actually using, sometimes it can cause us to become impatient. We become impatient with others because what we do is that we're losing sight of the bigger picture that God has this person on a journey. Other times, we can become frustrated. We become frustrated with other people because, well, we look at them and we think, you know what? It looks like you coming to Jesus is based upon superficial motives or a lack of a proper understanding of Jesus and his power and his authority. And so we can become, become frustrated. And yet, and yet, as we're going to see in today's passage, God takes a man. He's a man, by the way, who has a superficial faith. He is a man with imperfect motives. He is a man with an incomplete understanding about Jesus Christ. And he takes this man on a journey. And to break things down, we're going to see three steps to his journey. Three steps to the journey that God allows for him to go on in order to come to a place of true belief in Jesus. Firstly, we're going to see in verses 43 to 49, the man's recognition of what Jesus does. This is step number one, recognition for what Jesus does. We then move to verses 49 to 50. This is step number two, and that is acceptance of what Jesus says. So recognition of what Jesus does to now acceptance of what Jesus says. And then the third step in his journey, verses 51 to 54, is confidence in who Jesus is. That's step number three, recognition of what Jesus does, acceptance of what Jesus says, and finally getting to that point of having confidence in who Jesus is. This man begins with belief in Christ's works, you might want to call it. It then progresses on to a belief in Christ's words, and then finally it ends with belief in Christ's person, his works, his words, his person. Now, as you know, Jesus has just passed through a region of Samaria on his way to a region called Galilee. He stopped at a place called Jacob's Well. There he first disclosed to a Samaritan woman that he himself was the long-awaited Messiah. He is the one who has come from God in order to save the people from their sins. He then does a little bit more ministry in the area of um, Samaria, and many Samaritans are coming to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. And so this is what they get to see. And if you notice in your Bibles back there in verse 42, verse 42 really, it, it tells us and it leads us into today's passage. It says, 
Many saw for themselves, they indeed saw that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so this is how the Samaritans responded. This is how they saw Jesus. This is how they perceived Jesus. And really, this brings us right up to today's passage, which now begins with details of Jesus' journey from Samaria into a place called Cana of Galilee. And again, it's where we, right in this passage today, is where we're going to see the nobleman's journey to true faith. Let us get start here. First of all, giving our attention now to verses 43 to 49, in which we see the man's first step in his journey to true faith, and that first step is recognition of what Jesus does. Notice the transitionary verses there, picking up in verse 43. Look at it there in your Bible so you can follow along as well. He says, now after the two days, he departed from there and he went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his his own country. And so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Now these verses here are transitionary. In other words, they're telling us that Jesus kind of moves from Samaria now to Galilee, and it tells us a little something here in between times, but it does feed into the very first step of this man's journey to faith. Now, what are we seeing here in these transitionary verses? Well, firstly, we see here that Jesus, he contrasts the way that the Samaritans received him compared to the way that his fellow Jews received him in Galilee. There's a contrast that's going on. Unlike the Samaritans who recognized, as we've mentioned already, recognized Jesus as the Christ, the Savior of the world, well, those in Galilee, those in the region in which Jesus himself grew up, in Nazareth, that is, but Nazareth was in a place called Galilee, they failed to recognize this truth. They failed to recognize the truth of the person of who Jesus Christ actually is. And notice Notice there in verse 45, one of the reasons that he actually gives, one of the reasons that Jesus gives as to why they failed to recognize him in truth. He says in verse 45 that a prophet has no honor in his own country. That's one of the reasons that he gives to us here. In other words, Jesus really highlights the truth. He highlights the truth that those sometimes who are most familiar with him Well, they failed to hear his message. They failed to recognize the truth of who he really was. And I think when we're honest, when we're honest, many of us know this reality by way of personal experience. Sometimes, sometimes those who are closest to us, sometimes those who are most familiar with us, sometimes they can put up a wall of resistance when it comes to hearing spiritual truth from us. Sometimes these people can be friends, sometimes they're they're close family members, maybe the the, the people who we grew up with together, and you know what? These people may receive spiritual truth from any other number of people. Any number of people might give to them spiritual truth and they'll listen to them, but, but they don't want to hear it from you. Why? Well, simply because things in your relationship are too close, Things in your relationship are just too familiar. And what happens? Well, a wall of pride goes up and it prevents them from being able to hear anything of a spiritual nature from you. So this is the first thing that we can see in today's this, these, these transitionary verses. A contrast between how the Samaritans receive Jesus, again, gladly, warmly, the, the, the Christ, the Savior of the world, compared to the Galilean Jews, putting up a wall of resistance when it comes to the way that they receive him. But, but there's a second thing that we can point out here. In addition to this contrast between how the Samaritans received him versus how the Galilean Jews received him, the second thing that we can point out from verses 43 to 45 is the superficial faith of the Galileans. The superficial faith of the Galileans. Because on one hand, Jesus says that a prophet has no honor in his own country. For him, again, he's talking about the Galileans. But on the other hand, notice in verse 45 that it says, the Galileans received Jesus. You look at it and go, well, well, which is it? 
Are they putting up a wall of resistance to Jesus or are they receiving Jesus? Which one is it? At first, you look at that and you go, it kind of sounds a little bit like a contradiction. But if you notice carefully in verse 45, on what basis do the Galileans receive Jesus? On what basis? Notice that there in verse 45, the Galileans didn't welcome Jesus on the basis of his true identity. It doesn't say that, does it? As the Christ, the Savior of the world. But notice what it says there in verse 45 very carefully. Instead, <clears throat> they received him on the basis of his works. They received him on the basis of his miracles. In other words, they didn't see or view Jesus as the Son of God, as the Savior, but instead they looked at Jesus they saw his works, they saw his miracles, and so they viewed him merely as a miracle worker, a worker of miracles. You see, their faith wasn't motivated by who Jesus was, but their faith was motivated by what Jesus could do. In other words, it was a, a superficial welcome, a superficial welcome based on signs, based on wonders, not based upon a recognition of the true identity of Jesus as the Messiah. Now think about that. How often can this be the case in the, in the world today? There are people who are quite happy to come to Jesus because they see him as one who can give them what they want. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus is like the miracle worker. He's kind of like my genie in the bottle. I'm going to rub him the right way and hopefully it's going to, you know, there we go. He's going to give me exactly what I want. And sometimes you hear preaching in that kind of way. Come to Jesus and you can become this and that and that. And all of your, all your, your dreams and desires and everything else, they can all come. Just come on to Jesus and they'll come in droves, right? Everyone, just like back in Jesus' day. They all want to come to Jesus because, of course, who wouldn't want to come and get what it is that they want materially and selfishly and greedily? Who wouldn't want that? And so many are going to come, just as back then, just as they do today. They come to Jesus because they see him as something, someone who can give them what they want, rather than coming to Jesus because of who he is, because he is God because he is Lord, because he is the one whom every person must bow their knee to and surrender to him and to recognize him as the God who loves them, who has saved them, who has given themselves sacrificially for them. And so these are, these are what we can pull out from the two transitionary verses that we see leading up to what it is that Jesus is about to do. This all sets the scene now for what it is that Jesus is going to do in healing the royal son's official. So let us give our, let's give our attention now, picking up in verse 46, and this is where we start to see the account unfold for us. So let's look at it in your Bibles in verse 46. He says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water wine, and there was a certain nobleman who was, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee... He went to him and he implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. So what are we seeing here? What are we seeing in the way that this story really begins to unfold before our eyes? Well, the first thing that we can see here is that Jesus is approached by a man who is in desperate need. Jesus is approached by a man who is in desperate need. As Jesus returns, from Cana, returns to Cana of Galilee, which, as mentioned here, this is the first sign miracle, Jesus turning water into wine, well, we see here that the, the story now shifts. It shifts to a noble official. It shifts to a man who is a person of high status, New King James translates that as a nobleman. Possibly a person who was serving King Herod Antipas. He was up high. He was recognized as a man of prestige, a man of status. And this official's son, he has a son. And his son is seriously ill, almost to the point of death. And his son is located in a place called Capernaum. It's about 16 miles from Cana at that time. And so the man's 16-mile journey, you know, well, not by helicopter, not by plane, not by train, 
But him walking along that journey to get to him, that 16-mile journey to Jesus, it demonstrates his immense desperation. Now, for the parents among us, and maybe those who we interact with very, very closely, if you've ever been in a situation, if you've ever been in a situation where your child has been seriously hurt, if you've ever been in a situation where your child is seriously ill, you know, if you're anything like our family, there's been more than one very fast drive to the hospital with a child that we're, we're very concerned about. If you've ever had that kind of experience before, you'll know and you'll be able to empathize with just how burdened this, this official would have been. And what's more, it's interesting to note that regardless of his high-ranking status in society, regardless of his accumulated wealth, regardless of his position and his place of popularity, none of these things were able to help this man in his desperate time of need. Isn't that interesting? That sometimes that which we are living for, it does nothing when it comes to issues of life and death. And this he, a noble official we see in verse 47, he hears about Jesus coming into Galilee. He's got a very sick child, almost to the point of death. He hears Jesus coming to Galilee, no doubt. No doubt he has heard about all of the miracles, all of the signs, all the wonders, all of that which Jesus had already performed, and this was talked to him in such a convincingly kind of, convincing kind of way, it motivates him now to go and seek Jesus out. It motivates him to get out of his home, get out of his normal context, and actually go and try to seek Jesus out, pleading with him, please, please come and help my son. My son is almost dead. He's close to death. Please come and heal my son. Please take care of the desperate need within my life. In other words, this man comes to Jesus on the basis of recognizing what Jesus does. He comes on the basis of recognizing what he does. He comes to Jesus on the basis of Jesus' works. But in addition to Jesus being approached by a man with a very desperate need, a second thing that we can see in this section is the man's shallow faith. The man's shallow faith. You see, although this high-ranking official recognizes Jesus who can perform miracles, he does not recognize him as Christ, as the Savior of the world. Similar to the other Galileans, this official comes to Jesus based upon what Jesus can do rather than coming to Jesus for who he is. And because of this, because Jesus can clearly see the motivation of in this man's heart, it prompts him to say something to this man. And did you notice there what he says in verse 48? It prompts him to say, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now, <clears throat> it's helpful for us to understand that Jesus is not directing this statement exclusively to the noble official. We have to understand that. He's not just, just focusing just on him, even though what he says definitely 100% applies to him. Instead, he's addressing the broader Galilean audience. How do we know this? Because the word see in verse 48 there, it's a plural verb. In other words, Jesus sees the example of this noble official coming to him and rebukes him because he's only after signs and wonders, but the way that he talks about it is in a broader sense. He recognizes that many within Galilee are all coming to him on that same basis. Now, what this statement of Jesus does is that it really highlights a critical issue, doesn't it? It highlights a critical issue of a shallow kind of faith. It's a shallow kind of faith that requires and is dependent upon miraculous proof rather than trusting the word of Jesus and the divine authority of Jesus. Jesus points out this, this common human tendency that one's faith demands visible evidence in order to believe. I demand visible evidence, then I'll believe. But you see, Jesus' rebuke here, it calls for a faith that is not dependent upon visible signs. Jesus' rebuke here is a call for true faith, a faith that goes beyond just constant miracles to try to top up one's faith. And yet, and yet, this was the first step of this noble official's journey 
towards a true faith in Christ. He shouldn't have come to him based upon those motives. And Jesus makes it very, very clear, but this is where he was at. This is the first step in his journey. Despite his limited understanding, he approaches Jesus in recognition of what Jesus does and what he hopes that Jesus will do for him. It's the works of Jesus which draws the man in his deepest need. And I ask you this morning, are you in deepest need? Do you have a deep need in the, in, in, in within your heart right now? Do you have a deep burden, a deep challenge that's within there? My friends, you can bring that to Jesus. You can bring it to him just as this man brings his need to Jesus. Well, moving on from the first step in this man's journey to true faith, recognition of what Jesus does. Well, notice the second step in his journey, verses 49 to 50, and that is acceptance of what Jesus does says. Notice, if you would, how the nobleman now responds to Jesus' statement. He says, look, you people will only believe if you see signs and wonders, he says. But then notice what the nobleman, how he responds to Jesus, picking up in verse 49, the nobleman says to Jesus, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. And so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. So what are we seeing here? Well, the first thing that we're seeing here is the man's persistence. The man's persistence. The nobleman, he appears undeterred by Jesus' previous statement. He's undeterred by Jesus' previous rebuke for people coming to him on the basis of what he does rather than who he is. And so this man, he continues to plead with Jesus. He does so with urgency. He does so with desperation. He calls for Jesus. Please, Jesus, come physically with me to Capernaum to heal my son. He's almost close to death. Now, on one hand, the nobleman's plea reflects a sincere hope. It's a sincere belief that Jesus has the ability to meet his deepest need, to heal his son. But on the other hand, his plea reflects limited understanding, thinking that Jesus has to be there physically and be physically present right there before his son in order to, pre to perform a healing. The nobleman's fear and concern shows that he doesn't really grasp the full extent of who Jesus is. He doesn't grasp the full extent of Jesus' divine power, his divine authority. And so we see the man's persistence. But in addition to the man's persistence, notice secondly, we see in these verses the great compassion of Jesus. The great compassion of Jesus. And this is very interesting because even though Jesus rebuked the people for their need of a sign, and even though the nobleman's understanding was limited, I mean, his faith was incomplete, his faith is shallow, you would call it, even though these things are true, what we see here is that Jesus demonstrates deep compassion for the deep need which is brought to him. You see, I think sometimes we can think that in order for Jesus to hear us, in order for Jesus to respond positively to us, in order for Jesus to meet our need, we must first demonstrate perfect obedience. We must demonstrate, first of all, perfect theology. We have to somehow pray the right kind of prayer. And if we do all these things perfectly, Jesus kind of goes, tick, 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 tick. Now that you have perfectly come to me, now that you have perfect understanding about me, now I'm going to respond to your need. Sometimes we can think about God in that kind of way. But that's not what we're seeing here, is it? We're seeing a man who is coming to Jesus, not because of who he is, but because of what Jesus can do. We're seeing a man who is coming to Jesus, not really understanding the full extent of his authority and power and person. And yet, we see Jesus responding positively to this man's plea. Why? It's simply because Jesus is gracious, my friends. Jesus is gracious. He's merciful. He is compassionate. Jesus sees your pain. Jesus sees your difficulties. He sees what it is that we're going through. And what's more, Jesus 
He is willing to help us in our time of need. And let me tell you on what basis. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you've done something to earn it. But he helps us. He meets our needs despite all of our imperfections. He meets our deepest needs, our deepest struggles, despite all of our failures. Let me put it this way. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done or what you haven't done. You can come to Jesus, bringing your need to him, knowing that Jesus is a compassionate God. Remember that. But in addition to the great compassion of Jesus, a third thing we can draw from this section of the, of the account, and that is a demonstration of Jesus' power and authority. A demonstration of Jesus' power and authority. Rather than going with the man to Capernaum, he simply says the words, go your way, he says, your son lives. Now, this marks a, a pivotal moment within the story, so don't miss it. Because what we're seeing here is that Jesus asserts his power and his authority over sickness. He demonstrates that he has the ability to heal, and that ability to heal is not bound by proximity. It's not bound by geography. Instead, what we're seeing here is that not only does Jesus have compassion for the difficulties that we experience, not only does he have passion, compassion for the, the, the trials that we might be going through, but he also has the ability to do something about it. <laughs> I mean, what this means is that when we bring our pain to Jesus, when we bring our struggles to Jesus, when we bring them to him in prayer and we talk to him and say, God, help me, Jesus is not just a listening ear. He doesn't just offer a, a nice sympathetic rub on the back that says, there, there. But instead, when we bring our pain and our struggles to Jesus, as he is the one who can change our circumstances, he is the one that can do something about it. And in case you didn't, in case you didn't pick it up, it's not hard for him to do. It's not hard for him to meet our needs. He simply says the word, and that's enough. Circumstances change. When we're coming to God in prayer, it doesn't matter how big the situation might be in your own thinking or what your personal limitations are, humanly speaking. That's not hard for God. Jesus has to speak it. And that tricky thing that you're going through right now, that thing that's burdening and paining your heart right now, that, that can miraculously be taken care of in an instant. But in addition to the demonstration of Jesus' power and his authority, a fourth thing that we see here from these verses is that the man takes Jesus at his word. Notice it there in verse 50. In verse 50, it says, So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Now this is important, because this point marks the second step, step two in this man's journey to true faith. First, he came to Jesus, what? On the basis of Jesus' works. But here, the man responds to Jesus on the basis of his word. The man progresses from a faith in what Jesus does to now a faith that is based upon what Jesus says. And it's with that, the noble official, he departs without any further questioning, without any further physical proof, the man simply accepts Jesus at his word and he accepts what Jesus has said and he goes his way. And so what are the steps? What are the steps that we've seen in this man, this noble official's man, man, his man's life, John chapter four, what do we actually see here? What do, have we seen the steps in this man's journey to true belief? We've seen firstly, the recognition of what Jesus does, that's step number one. Step number two, acceptance of what Jesus says, and this leads us now to finally a third step in this man's journey to true belief. This is found next in verses 51 to 54, and that is confidence in who Jesus is. If you'd give your attention, please, one more time to verse 51, and notice what it says there. It says, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. 
Then he inquired of them the hour that he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. Now again, this is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. And so what are we seeing in these verses? Well, the first thing that we're seeing from this, these verses, or this section of the story, is the son's amazing recovery. The son's amazing recovery. As this nobleman, as this noble official is traveling back to Capernaum, his, son, his servants meet him, and they meet him with the wonderful news, Master, your son has recovered. Now, up until this point, think about it. Think about it from the man's point of view. Think about it from the nobleman's point of view. All he had was the word of Jesus. That's all he had. He didn't have any evidence. All that man had is what, what it is that Jesus had spoken to him. As he was walking home on that journey, no doubt the words of Jesus must have just been turning over and over in his head. Turning over and over again in his head. All he was thinking about are those words of Jesus that says, Go your way, your son lives. He had no evidence. There was no evidence of it. All he had was the word of Jesus, and he left. And no doubt as he's walking home, he's thinking to himself, again, his, his heart is burdened for the illness and the distress of his son. All he's clinging on to at this point is the words of Jesus. It's his only hope. He's got nothing else, physically speaking, to go back to. All he has is the words of Jesus, and they're churning around and around in his mind on the journey home. But the question, no doubt, that must have been churning over in his mind was simply this. Would the words of Jesus truly come to pass? Did Jesus truly have the power and the authority to speak this miracle into existence? Well, as soon as the man hears the story about his son, what's the one detail that he wants to find out? What's the one detail that this nobleman wants to find out about his son's recovery? He wants to find out, what is the exact hour that my son got better? Do you see what's on his mind? It almost sort of seems, it seems as though it's not even the son's recovery anymore. The recovery the one thing that he asks them is, what hour did it happen? He wants to know whether there is a connection between his son's recovery and the words that Jesus spoke. And sure enough, as soon as the servants tell him the time, the seventh hour, about 1 p.m., the noble official realizes something. He realizes that his son's healing didn't just come about by chance, but instead he recognizes that his son had, in fact, been healed by Jesus. At the exact time that Jesus said, your son will live, the son began to recover from that life-threatening illness, whatever it might have been. And so we ask ourselves the question, what did this tell the nobleman about Jesus? Well, it tells him that the words of Jesus are effective. It tells him, it was confirming that the words of Jesus are effective. It's demonstrating the power of Jesus and the authority of Jesus that they're not just limited by location, but Jesus can heal. Jesus can meet needs. Jesus can meet your deepest need and anyone's deepest need, even from a distance and by his word alone. But in addition to the son's amazing recovery, a second thing we see here is the man's confidence and who Jesus is. So amazing recovery, yes, but the second thing we see here is the man's confidence in who Jesus is. You see, when this man is considering the details of his meeting with Jesus, and then he compares that with the, 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 the miraculous recovery of his son, he is convinced that this is not just a coincidence at work. The timing of the, the, this, this miracle, that the timing was miraculous, the boy's recovery was far more than what circumstances could have brought about by themselves. And what was the result? Well, back in verse 47, we saw a man coming to Jesus based upon what Jesus does. We saw in verse 50, a man, the man believing Jesus, taking Jesus at his word. But here in verse 53, 
we see a man's belief representing full confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. It says that he believed. Now, you might go back and say, well, he already believed. In the previous verse, in verse 50, he said that he believed. Yeah, but he was believing in his words. But here in verse 53, he's now believing in his person. Not only did he say the words, but now he follows through. And that which he spoke has now come to pass. His belief about Jesus turned into a commitment to Jesus. And so hopefully we're seeing here a progression in this man's faith. It started out with an inadequate faith. It was just based upon signs and and miracles of Jesus. It then progressed to a preliminary faith that was based upon the works of Jesus. But then finally, it progresses to a full-fledged faith where his confidence is resting fully in the person of Jesus. You notice really carefully there that that faith didn't just end with him, but instead he passed it on to his entire family. He passed it on to those who were closest with him, to him. I mean, how could he hold it to himself? How could he go back into the context of those who were around him and keep his mouth shut, given the gracious work and the compassionate work of Jesus? How can anyone experience the great grace of God and then somehow keep silent about it and not share that with other people? This man had experienced the grace of God, the compassion of God firsthand. He could not keep his mouth shut. He could not just keep that to himself. But he shared it. He shared it with his whole family. And it says his whole family believed as well. Similar to the Samaritan woman in the earlier in the chapter, he couldn't keep the news to himself. Now, of course, as we take a step back, what we see in this story is that even though Jesus rebukes the people for their need of a sign, he still demonstrates the compassion and his power in healing the official son. What does it show us? Well, it shows us that Jesus' miracles were not merely displays of divine power. It wasn't just a display of divine power and look at at all the powerful things I can do, but they were specifically tied to revealing the true identity of himself. What he did in his miracles were to show that he is the Son of God. He is God come from heaven down to earth and he is one God who is deserving and worthy of our faith and our confidence. Think about that. He demonstrated what it is that he demonstrated to prove the truth of his true identity. Well, as we begin to bring things to a close here in our study today, let's just think about how what we've seen and think about how this really applies to our lives today. We saw a man on a journey to true belief, The first step was a recognition, recognizing what Jesus does. We saw a man who was drawn to Jesus. Why? Because he saw and he heard about the miraculous work that Jesus was doing. How does that apply to us? What can we take from that? What can we apply to our own lives? Well, think about this. In a sense, there are miracles all around us, right? In a sense, Each and every one of you and me, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we are walking miracles. The Spirit of God has changed our hearts, enabled us to see our need for Jesus Christ, giving us faith to be able to respond positively to the gospel. We're walking miracles. And what's more, God's Spirit continues to dwell in us. He's changing us progressively from within. And guess what's happening in our lives? the results are increasingly seen outwardly to those who are around us as we're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ by the grace of God. The encouragement for us today is to actively pursue sanctification, actively pursue growing in Christ likeness, because as we do, as we're growing more and more like Jesus, others can see. And when others can see, in a sense, they are seeing the work and the miraculous work that Jesus Christ is doing in our lives. And let's just hope and pray that that might be a reason to ask us why or how 
Well, how could this be possible for us? We look at the miracles back in that day and we go, well, where are all the miracles? Where's, where's the, the, where is that happening today? It is happening in that kind of way today. But don't discount one of the greatest miracles that we see around us, and that's the heart that was once darkened and hardened against God that has now become pliable to God and is a life that has been changed. Jesus said in Matthew 5, uh, 5 16, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But in addition to this, we saw that the man's journey of true belief, what did it involve? Acceptance of what Jesus says. Now think about this. In order for the man to know that the miracle could be true for him, what did he need? He needed to hear the words of Christ. He needed to hear the word of God. Now, I think we kind of know how that applies to us, don't we? It's not enough to simply draw the attention of others by growing in Christ's likeness, them seeing our own deeds. I'm saying that's important, but it can't end there. Instead, once people are drawn by the miraculous works of Christ, we must, and we have a responsibility to, share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to share with them how this miracle can also take place and it can be true for them as well and to communicate that with clarity and with understanding. And finally, we've seen the third step in the man's journey of true belief was confidence in who Jesus is. Once the man had been drawn by the works of Christ, he heard the words of Christ, what happened? He experienced the miracle from Christ. Now, here's the thing. Just as Jesus has the power to restore physical life to the human body of a man's son, well, in the same way, Jesus has the power to grant true spiritual life to the heart of the sinner, just like you, just like me. And it's at that point when God grants that new spiritual life to the heart, at that point, the word of Christ brings about confidence in the person of Christ, so that by the grace of God, they experience the miracle of salvation through life and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you want to put it all together, listen to this. As we live our lives to the glory of God, by becoming more and more like the Son of God, people are going to see the miraculous work of Christ in us in the way that it's transformed us from darkness into light. And as they see that, and as we have contact with them, let us share how that miracle of salvation can be true for them too through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as soon as we share it with them, we trust that by God's grace, he will bring about that miracle We walk away from that gospel conversation. We walk away from that sharing that little bit with that friend or family member about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we just trust that somehow, some way, on their journey, that God would ignite their heart, change their heart, help to give them faith to trust in the gospel so that they too can become a walking miracle. Now, if you're here this morning, if if you're... If you're carrying something heavy at the moment, if there's something that's really burdening your heart at the moment, if you feel that you're going through some form of distress, pain, struggle right now, it's really threefold from what we're seeing here today, right? Just real simple here. Bring your need to Jesus. That's number one. Bring your need to Jesus. Believe the word of Jesus. What does the word of God say about your situation? and then prepare to experience restoration from Jesus. Bring your need to him, believe his word, experience that restoration. If you're here this morning, and if you do not consider yourself to be a believer in Jesus Christ, I ask you the question, what are you seeing from today's passage? What are you seeing? And would you respond to what it is that you're seeing in today's passage? You have a God in Jesus, who's come to earth, he has proven himself to be who he is that he says that he is. He's done these miracles. He does these signs. He does, he does all these wonders. 
You can see his works. Would you come to him? Would you believe in him, not just for his work's sake, but you've seen very clearly what it is that Jesus can do, what it is that Jesus has said, but would you now trust him in who Jesus is? In the quietness of your own heart today, you simply need to, before God, recognize that you have sinned and that your sin deserves the just penalty of hell. You're lying, you're stealing, you're not putting God first, you taking the Lord's name in vain. Each one of us sin, each one of us are in that position. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And although you may think right now that your deepest need is whatever it is in the physical realm right now, let me tell you, your deepest need is to get right with God. You could get that physical thing all sorted out today, and let me tell you, if you died tonight, you would not be going to heaven. You'd be going to hell, because that is the just place where God is sending all of those who will not trust in His Son. If you don't trust that He died for your sins in your place, you will have to pay the penalty for them yourself. But think on this. Although your sins deserve the just wrath and penalty of hell, which is separation from God forever, God has demonstrated his compassion for you. God has demonstrated his grace to you. That while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. When he died upon that cross, it wasn't just a a random act of unfortunate circumstances, but he voluntarily laid down his life for you because he is a compassionate God. And there he is taking the full penalty and the wrath that your sin deserves upon himself, rising again from death three days later, ascending into heaven, and now is offering to you the gift of eternal life. You can have certainty of your future. You can have your deepest need met here this morning if you would place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the one who died for you. Not just trust in his works, his miracles, not just trust and just saying, hey, just words of what he says he's going to do, but trusting in his person because Jesus is reliable. Jesus is authoritative. We have seen that from the scriptures today. If you are here today, if you are here today and you have not placed your faith in Jesus as the one who died in your place, let me urge you to do that. Do that today and you too can experience the miracle The miracle that this man experienced, the miracle of coming to a true faith in who Jesus is. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your time, this time here now, and your word, being able to see clearly the truth of who you are, what you what you do, and through the person of Jesus. Thank you that you are taking people on a journey. Thank you that you've taken many of us on that journey to a place of true belief in you. And I do pray for those of us who are here today who have not taken that first step, who have not placed their faith and their trust in you. Lord, please help them. Give them the faith to believe that you are the one that can change their lives. You are the one that loves them. You are the one who who is compassionate. You are the one who laid down your life so that they can live from freedom from sin and enjoy a fullness of life with you in the center. Lord, please help them to respond to what it is that they've seen in today's passage, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.